The Psalms are filled with prayers of solace, seeking the comfort of God, the peace that God offers, the peace that's found in Him. And so as we think, consider, hide me, Savior, oh, hide me. And all the, during the times of our trials, and certainly there can be comfort found in Jesus Christ, knowing the promises that are, that are given to us from the Father, from Him, that within Him, that if we abide in Him, we will find solace. We will find the peace that passes all understanding. Um, certainly, uh, that uh, there are times in our own lives when we, we rely upon and seek out God for solace. Um, the title of this morning's lesson is, What Will This Babbler Say? You'll recognize this from Acts chapter 17, verse 17. Paul had gone to Athens to, and had noticed the many, many altars that they had made, even so many that just to be certain that they had not left out any of the God, they made, a, they made an altar to the, the unknown God. And from there, Paul launches from that platform into the true one living God and the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, there are some places you may, if, if you have spoken in any place or various places, there you'll find that there are some audiences that are tough, hard to speak to, hard to, to uh, impress and, and persuade. This is exactly the kind of audience that talk, to, that talk about. As we consider the verse, uh, Acts 17, verse 17, uh, speaking of Paul when he'd gone to Athens, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? You'll recognize that as the title. What will this babbler say? Others, uh, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And you'll, you'll recognize at a certain point where he got to the resurrection of Christ, they began to mock him, thinking this is such an irregular and impossible event. You know, some folks just make hard audiences. Some folks just make for hard hearers. And I don't mean hard of hearing. I mean rather just hard to be impressed, hard to be uh, persuaded. More exactly, some folks make it difficult for themselves to hear or apprehend what is being said. Paul ran into the audience of this, such as this, and as we see in Acts 17. You know, as we think about those who make it difficult for themselves, there was a point at which Paul had left. He, he would, it was as was his custom to go into the synagogues to preach to the Jews, to teach and to, to uh, make arguments that Jesus is the Christ using the Old Testament scriptures. And there comes a point where the, 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 at that time that, that the Jews were not receiving what Paul had said. Rather, they began to, to uh, ref, uh, reject what he had said publicly and to uh, refute him and, and basically impede his, any progress he could make. So finally, he said, he gets up, dusts off his feet, said, because you, you have considered yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we go into the Gentiles. Of course, the Gentiles were elated with his news that Paul would spend time preaching to them Jesus. And, and uh, so the Jews had rendered themselves and considered themselves unworthy for everlasting life. And so it is with these in Athens, those who were so uh, um, intellectual, they had rendered themselves difficult to hear. The philosophers, if you think about the philosophy of that day, the words philosophy or love of wisdom and philosopher, they each occur only once in the Bible, and, that, and, that, and it wasn't in a kind way. Rather, it was a derogatory sense. As Thayer's lexicon indicates that Greek uses connoted zeal for or skill in any art or science. That's the, the technical word or meaning of, of this word, the, the Greek word for philosophy, and that certainly is... Uh, worthy of consideration in any skill or in the art of science. But it is not genuine philosophy which Paul dis deprecates, but philosophy and vain receipt, uh, deceit, I should say, after the, the traditions of men, after the rudiments, that is idolatrous principles of the world and not after Christ. We can see Colossians 2, 8, about those who would follow after the, the uh, rudiments of this world. The philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics in, in Acts 17, 18, who led Paul to the Areopagus and heard him only part way through are not to be taken as worthy or even serious representatives of those philosophies. They, uh, the, considering the philosophies of the Stoics or, or uh, 
or the Epicureans, they were not necessarily representative of, of, of the quality, highest quality of those who follows after that philosophy or, or uh, following. Their superficiality is indicated in verse 21. As Paul, as Luke wrote, I should say, that they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That was their endeavor. They wanted to, of course, we, we do have a thirst for knowledge, but this was a case where that was their whole life about hearing some new thing. Um, as we consider the Epicureans, what were they about? What, I'm, I'm trying to build a, 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 a scenario that we can appreciate. Why did Luke include these, these descriptions, these, these people there? Why did he include that? So as we consider this, the Epicureans, the, they, they were followers of Epicurus, the Greek philosopher who lived from 341 to 270 BC. He taught that nature rather than reason is the true reality. Nothing exists but atoms and void, that is, matter and space. The chief purpose of man is to achieve happiness. That was what they were all about. He has free will to plan and to live a life of pleasure. Epicurus gave the widest scope of this matter for, of pleasure, interpreting it as avoidance of pain, so that the mere enjoyment of good health would be pleasure. So as he considered he, his philosophy, his teaching, that uh, he gave the widest scope for all of this, so that it's, it's about deriving good health, and that in our living health, in health, we have pleasure. There was a commercial years ago that came out when you have, that made the statement, when you have your health, you have everything. Well, there's something to be considered that, that uh, if we have poor health and living in pain all the day long, no matter what wealth we have, it would make no difference. We are still suffering. So it would be far better to have nothing and yet have our health and enjoy the life as best we could. And, but uh, as he would uh, render good health would be pleasure, such stress on good things of, of life, while very practical, is also very dangerous. For the philosophers, the highest joy is found in mental and intellectual pursuits, but for lesser souls, lower gods or central, lower goals, I should say, or of central satisfaction fulfill the greatest pleasure. So you have those intellectuals who are, who are trying to transcend their, their, their existence here, but you have the lower base fellows who would look only for the sensual, the, the pleasure, and the, the, uh, the touchy touch and taste and feel, that, that kind of sensual pleasure, fulfill the greatest pleasure. Thus, the high standards of the founder was not maintained, and the philosophy gained a bad reputation. Well, since such teaching appealed to the common man, this natural philosophy became widespread as, as it was. And as we think, what was their philosophy? Pleasure is everything, that whatever we do to find it, that that's what we do. And our existence is... Uh, matter of observing and recognizing the standard laws of nature and by adapting our behavior to such we would therefore find pleasure and that was the sum total of their life what about the stoics stoicism it's a nature it taught is a hierarchical unity controlled by the universal logos and in personal reason at once eminent and divine um, as they thought they could also participate in eating. You know, I think about uh, secular humanism. It does nothing other than make man himself the god of his universe. And so I look at similarities to, to stoicism to that of secular humanism. Uh, as a logos uh, being man can perceive and add assent to the determinism, which makes all events necessary and which therefore reduces evil to a mere appearance. So evil really isn't evil. It just looks bad. And of course there are natural consequences of things, but there's nothing really wrong with anything. Its view of sin was hopelessly shallow, since it did not think in terms of obedience to personal God. Sin was simply an error of judgment, easily rectified by a change of opinion. Now why do I bring these up? Well, as I was saying, I was trying to build a scenario so we could appreciate what Paul was faced with. And as I look at this, I don't see any difference to the audience that was there sitting before Paul, and the, any audience of today uh, steeped in the worldly affairs and the, and the worldly life, that they would be just as stoic, they would just be as, as uh, philosophers of, of uh, uh, reason as anybody else, as those men in that day. And so as we think about this, uh, that was certainly a hard, hard audience for us of Paul to try to persuade them Especially since, as they consider him a babbler and that strange new gods, they had never heard about the God of the Bible or the Christ having been crucified. And so what kind of 
obstacle did he have to mount, that he had to overcome, to preach to them so they would understand the love and grace of God. You know, people look at God as, as vengeful and, and payback, and that he, he, he uh, 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 <laughs> when, you know, we, he punishes those who don't do what he wants them to do. And so he's very vengeful, and, and they look upon this God of all powerful, and yet he toys with human beings, and so they have a very dark idea of God rather than the light and the love and the grace of God. And so they, they, don't, they don't perceive that. But as we put grace and love in perspective of the natural consequence of choice of the choices of people who don't recognize sin as sin, who follow and lead a life of sin, don't recognize it at all, of course, denying God, that the natural consequence we know that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And the love of God, how, what about that? The grace of God. You see, the, 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 uh, the, the, con the consequences, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why it's so difficult to speak to so many like who have the stoic attitudes about they'll just watch and see. They're very cold and calculating. And rather than being impressed with the grace of God, they're just observing and being very reasonable. Of course, I'm not saying that we ought not be reasonable, that we ought not be uh, um, discerning. The Bible certainly, and God ex certainly expects us to be discerning. But, uh, but we need to understand there's an attitude that a person places himself above what's going on, above the gospel of Christ. You think about what God, who God is, the, the creator of the universe. Above all things, with all authority and all power, of course, Christ having all authority and power, and as, as he's reigning over his kingdom in heaven. And so as God speaks to us through his gospel, through the Bible that we have, through the gospel that was preached first from the mouths of the eyewitnesses, the apostles, and through the mouths of those who were converted and believed, and then, of course, through the, the pen of those who were inspired to write, as God is trying to save us, and there are those who are above that and just look down upon that, as, as though, is this a sales pitch or what? And, and so I think about, that was the audience that Paul was speaking to that day. What will this babbler say? With what little we have been introduced about the Epicureans and the Stoics, their indifferent attitude is expected. They would be indifferent toward what Paul would try to persuade them with. A center forth of strange gods. As you might think, let's satisfy our appetite for new thought. That's all they did all day long. Let's satisfy our appetite for new thought. That's what feeds us. In verse Acts 17, 21, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there, there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's, that's why the, when the, uh, the, the, the uh, definition of the Stoics and, and the uh, Epicureans I've read, why that when it's referred to a philosophy, it's not in the sense of the highest level of, of, of intellect. Rather, it's the, the rather indifference uh, to the truth that's being uh, preached or taught, or it's to, to learn something that's important, but it's rather to satisfy a personal, selfish goal. Um, you think about how those Epicureans were so reasoning. A lot of people think themselves being so open-minded that, 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 and that, that people who believe the Bible are so closed-minded and, and uh, focused so narrowly. They're very narrow-minded, but we who disregard the Bible were so open-minded, just like those Epicureans and Stoics who wanted to learn num some new thing. How open-minded. Hmm. How open-minded indeed that they reject the, the, the testimony of the Word of God. So remember the saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And of course, that, that is, uh, uh, we need to understand, if we don't stand for anything, we will fall for anything. So we, there, we need to be uh, affirmed, affirm what is the truth, and stand there in the truth. But yet, we need to be open-minded so that we recognize the truth for what it is. That is the truth of God. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, people are just like them today, their attitude is skepticism, they're setting themselves apart from the message, sort of like sitting above in judgment. 
and the philosophies they follow are empty. They have no real power. Just a position of appeasing themselves into believing their life's choices really make a difference. The message was different from anything else they'd ever heard before. It was definitely different. As they said, what will this babbler say? He's bringing forth uh, strange gods. It not only contains the facts which reveal the love of God, but it also contains life-changing challenges. Something to do because of what God in Christ has done. That's probably something you've never heard before. That there's the message about Jesus dying upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead. But what about it? What does that mean? And that's the message of the gospel. It goes further than the mere facts, but rather, this is God's saving grace. What are we going to do about it? There's something for us to do to obtain that grace, that forgiveness of sins that God provides us. Um, it it uh, contains warnings of the calamity to come if disregarded. It contains promises of the reward if acted upon and, and, and we live by. It is not something which is to be received with passive indifference. It's not to be received with passive indifference. The passive indifference is to be unimpressed with the gift of God, with the sacrifices he and the Christ made on our behalf. Passive indifference is to reject the message. Passive indifference is to reject the truth, the coming destruction with disregard. Um, think about, we're all familiar, I'm sure, of the account of the Titanic, the, the, the largest ship that up to that time, an ocean liner ever been built up to that time was the Titanic um, in, in modern times. And uh, we're aware, in fact, it was advertised, we we're told that we were advertised the, it was unsinkable. But the fact is, they only advertised it was practically unsinkable. They recognized, you know, you, you really can't, you really can't say, uh, ultimately, it cannot be sunk. They recognized the, the short, the, uh, uh, there were uh, um, weaknesses, and they recognized that. But, as we consider the Titanic and the event in 1912, quite over 100 years ago, as we consider the, the facts, at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912, the British ocean liner Titanic sinks into the North Atlantic Ocean, about 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. The massive ship, which carried 2,200 passengers and crew, had struck an iceberg two and a half hours before. So it took some time for the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, hull of the ship to, to take on enough water to start drawing it down uh, beneath the, the surface. The Titanic was designed by the Irish shipbuilder William Peary and built in Belfast and was thought to be the world's fastest ship. Well, not really, but it was fast for its hulk, its, its size. It had used new technology in the hull and in, in the, in the uh, uh, propellers and in the, uh, uh, the uh, rudder. It spanned 883 feet from stern to bow. It was longer than most buildings were tall in the world. Um, and its hull was divided into 16 compartments. This was the, what, they, what they put all the trust in, these, these 16 separate compartments that were isolated so that if any one would, would be punctured and water come in through the, through the hull, that the other 15 uh, uh, compartments would sustain its, its uh, buoyancy. And so even if up to four, they thought, if up to four of these compartments were flooded, the rest of the, of the, the compartments would maintain its buoyancy. And so they had a lot of faith in that mighty titanic uh, vessel. But after stopping at Cherbourg, France, in Queenstown, Ireland, to pick up some final passengers, the massive vessel sent out at full speed for New York City. However, just before midnight on April 14th, the RMS Titanic, titanic failed to divert its course from an iceberg and ruptured at least five of its whole compartments. And you know the rest of the story, that that, that rupture went through five of the compartments and it, and it began to... Uh, Fill, those compartments filled up and began to tilt that Titanic down to where the water began to run over the top of the other compartments. And eventually, all the hull began to take on water, and it, and it eventually sank. In fact, there was a point at which the hull, uh, the, 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 the forces that were on that hull, because of the way it was, it was poised in the water, the, uh, the hull broke in half. And there it followed the, continued on to sink to the bottom of the, of the sea. Um, so, and, and there were considerations about, they, they had reduced numbers of uh, lifeboats, and so many more people died that didn't have to die. But, I think about this, that uh, given that history, and we know that, you know, of course, uh, 
Hindsight is 2020. But imagine, how would you respond if you were to warn passengers, the captain and crew of the Titanic, the impending danger of their imminent perishing? If they were to respond the way that many people have responded to the gospel message. Think about this. You know the Titanic is going to go down. And you happen to, this is imaginary, of course, but you happen to tell, be able to tell this captain and the crew and all the passengers on this vessel, it's going down. Well, they'd build this belief. How impossible could it be? This ship cannot sink as, from their perspective. And, uh, and so you're trying to impress upon them, no, it's going to sink. It's going to, to sink. It's going to hit an iceberg. What kind of, and yet, how would they, what was their indifference to it all? No. Can't. How would we respond to that? Such indifference, such lack of concern, such denial of the truth. In fact, Captain Smith, think about his role. Now, I don't mean to denigrate his, his uh, heroism in, in trying to deal with what, what was a, 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 a very difficult situation, but as we, as we look back in retrospect, Captain Smith failed the passengers and crew of the Titanic. He failed to heed the ice warnings. He did not slow his ship when ice was reportedly directed in his path and allowed lifeboats to leave the sinking ship partially filled, unnecessarily adding at least 500 names to the list of the dead. So in a way, Captain Smith played a role in, in uh, reducing the number that would be saved. And he actually played a role in its demise and its eventual sinking by not giving heed to this warning sign that we're all about them. Now we take this idea of not heeding warning signs with those who hear the gospel with a stoic philosophy, uh, an indifference to uh, standing above the words as it were, as they would judge upon what they were hearing. And they're given all the evidence that would indicate your ship is going down. Your ship is going to sink, surely. And yet they look at you with indifference and say, no, I'm living a good life. I have everything I need. In fact, I'm, I'm making the right decisions. I'm doing things in such a way that I'm profiting the most. I'm preparing myself for my latter years. Everything is going the way it's supposed to be. I'm living comfortably, as a matter of fact. Better than most of the world. In fact, better than 99% of the world. And yet, you're telling me that my ship is going to sink and look at you. Okay. Well, we think about uh, the gospel message itself and what it, what it reveals to us that it is warning us that the ship is going to sink. And so one would, give, would be wise to pay heed to the warning that as Paul be, began to try to persuade them, and we've learned that later on, few of them actually did, were persuaded. Few did. They rejected him uh, nearly wholesale. If you think about the Roman epistle, and in Romans 10, 7, what do you think about when you hear Romans 10, 17? Faith comes of the hearing, hearing by the word of God? Yes. There's a reason why Paul is quoting Isaiah chapter 52. In the Roman epistle, he quotes the prophet Isaiah 52, verse 7, to make a point. Romans 10, 14, from which we begin our look at this passage, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Let's think about those that who, who would be, in, in Isaiah's day, who would be persuaded of the truth. But today, he's making, Paul is making application to the Christian age of, of Isaiah's prophecy. And how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be seen and sent? All these questions that are asked, well, it's impossible. Nobody can hear to believe unless there's a preacher to preach the word to them. And that preacher can't preach unless he's sent. He's supported by somebody or some group, thereby that he can send these glad tidings to warn them of the message. And as he goes on, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful, how timely. How timely. What a blessing to hear the, the facts, the warnings of the dangers coming and the, and the way out to salvation. What was the point of Paul's bringing this up? Verse 16, but they had not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, or Isaiah said, Lord, who had believed our report? And that's the case. Those Stoics who heard him, the Epicureans who heard them, they rejected him pretty much. What they heard, because they were above what he said, they were, they were hearing passively or, or, or indifferently. And, and so the question asked, 
They have not, or who have heard a report? They have not all obeyed the gospel. Who have heard the report? Ultimately, what is it that saved man from his predicament of sin? What is it that man needs in order to be saved? And from where does that come? Romans 10, 17. The point that Paul is making about faith. So then faith comes of the hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How did the Jews respond to the gospel? Generally speaking, we know that initially the first, the first Jews were all, the first Christians were all Jews. We know that. But, but the multitude, the majority of the Jews rejected the gospel message that Jesus was the Christ. In his epistle to the church in Rome, Paul further quotes from Isaiah to show how Gentiles would receive the gospel of Christ and how the children of Israel would reject it. There's a reason I'm bringing this up. I'll bring up in the point in a moment. But I say, have they not heard? Romans 10, 18, had. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not, all, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not of me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So it was, as, as they had learned, the Israelites had learned, from Moses saying that, that God would use the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, to turn back to him. Um, but then he goes on with Isaiah being even more bold, saying that, God was found of them that sought him not. Well, we can see that today among the Gentiles that were added to the church in the first century and then, then following on, that uh, they had been given the opportunity to receive the gospel. And as Moses was really speaking about the, uh, the, the uh, gods using in other people, the, the, the uh, Babylonians and the, and the other Gentiles who would... Who would drive them to jealousy, but today the same principle is there that those uh, uh, the Jews who rejected Christ, the Gentiles were added to the church uh, perhaps causing them uh, reason to pause to consider what they are rejecting and as, as it, uh, God had said, but to Israel he said, all day long I stretched forth my hands to disobedient and gainsaying people and it's the same thing today God bringing forth the gospel. It's being preached all over the world today. And yet, how many have responded to that with that stoic attitude, an indifferent attitude of, I'm, I'm beyond this. I'm better than, than, than that. It's the same way that most people respond to the message today. But how long will people ignore the truth? Why do people just throw their future away? Why is it? Isaiah 53, 1, the, the original prophecy, Isaiah wrote, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The saving message and the frustrating response to the Savior is what? As we look at Isaiah 53, 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as root out of dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness, and when we, we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should not desire him. It was a prophesying about that when the Messiah came, the Jews would see him and say, He's nobody different than any of the rest of us. He's no one to be impressed with. And so, there, as they would say, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And as we think about the message of the gospel today, is there that message, that saving message that they look upon that, and they look upon the, those who preach it, and they say, there's nothing there for me. That's pretty much the same attitude. It's pretty much the same attitude. They, they, they ignore the truth. So, um, as we consider what Jesus has done, the saving gospel message that's supposed to, intended to save mankind, so many are rejecting it because of that stoic philosophy. They won't, won't articulate it like that. But the same idea that I'm smart, I know what's going on, I'm using my reasoning abilities, and I, and I just don't see anything there in this, the message of the gospel. But we see that the Jesus became the satisfying atonement for our sins and satisfied the justice of God. And the recognition of the authority of God, that he is in control, that we are his creatures, and our sinning against him has separated us from him, and the justice of God is that we die. Remember Romans 6.27, or 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So as we consider Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has, both Jew and Gentile, being justified freely by, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Propitiation, that's an atoning sacrifice. That's a satisfying sacrifice, in this case, to God. That Christ shedding his blood upon the cross is the only thing that satisfies the justice of God that whereby we can be forgiven of our sins. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. And that's where the, the forbearance of God, don't people see that? God is forbearing to the point where he allows us, he, he gives us the opportunity to be forgiven and, and all our sins will be forgotten and we can be with him forever in heaven in spite of the fact that we're as guilty as anybody else of sin and has divided us from him, and, has, and we have earned those wages of sin, that is death, as he continues in verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that is God's righteousness, that he might be just, he's completely just in what he's done. He's legal. And the justifier of him, the justifier, not only is God righteous in the judgments that he renders, but also... In justifying the sinning man, he's the one who just justifies them, that his providing that propitiation himself of him which believed in Jesus Christ. What a gift. What is the reward for a life which derives its total pleasure, its total reward, and its total adherence to the principles of sin, selfishness, self-centeredness? We know that. We've read that already. The wages of sin is death. Paul asked that, that piercing question in Romans 6, 21. What fruit had ye then in those things where ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So as he writes to those in Rome, both Jew and Gentile Christians, what was your life like before you made the gospel? Was, were you working toward a beneficial end of your life? Or was everything leading to death? Everything leading to not, uh, unfruitfulness? Well, it's a rhetorical question. It's one that's obvious. Well, yeah, I was real proud of my sinful life. No, not at all. Think about this. What does one hope to gain from a life which is void of God in his saving grace? What does he hope to gain? Temporary satisfaction? Yeah. Temporary, what do I mean? A lifetime of satisfaction? That's still temporary. Ultimate delusion of what is to come? Yes. You're rejecting the facts that in the end there's a day coming in which God will judge God will judge both the righteous and the unjust and and uh, don't be fooled the storm is coming and if you haven't made the preparations then you will suffer the consequences just like those on the Titanic who if given an opportunity to get off that, that uh, vessel probably would if they'd heard it unless they reject the message what about those who hadn't have made the preparations, who have made the choice to come to Christ? Romans 6.22 But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. That's the reward for the believers who have obeyed. Everlasting life. That promise. What's in store for the other choice? Well, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Outside of Christ, there is no hope. Outside of Christ, there is no hope. Did God have to do this? Did Jesus have to die for us? Why did they do it? You know, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the gift of God. Those Epicureans and Stoics to whom Paul preached, where did their apprehensiveness leave them? Think about it. When they rejected Paul and his message, where did it leave them? John 3.18 He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That, I think, the category of the, the Stoics and Epicureans who rejected Paul and his message. 
Some who were there that day, they believed, but most did not. So how would you respond if someone was burned a great gift? You had sacrificed so much to give. If you had spent a lot of time preparing, maybe you have artistic abilities, you spend a lot of time getting all the resources and materials you need and create a beautiful, beautiful uh, object of art to be, to be enjoyed by everyone as they see it. Oh, what a wonderful work. And you b bestow this gift upon somebody and say, what's that? How would you feel about that? How would you feel rejecting that, that gift you'd spent so much time preparing for them? Um, in John 9, 3.19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. So what about today? Do men love darkness rather than light? Would people rather stay in blissful ignorance, rejecting any challenges to their choice? John 3.20 For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. The answer is yes. They fear being exposed, their sin being exposed, and then rather than the right response to God, admitting his sins and finding forgiveness, they hide it all. They don't want to be shown as, as being in that area. But not all reject the saving message of the gospel, as we see in John 3.21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So, where are you? Do you love darkness rather than light? Have you placed yourself above being affected? Will you let your indifference keep you from the rich gift which God has so graciously given just to save you? I said just to save you. I mean, to save you, that's what he did. Now you consider, one hour and 20 minutes after Titanic went down, one hour, just one hour and 20 minutes, the, the canard liner Carpathia arrived. The survivors in the lifeboats were brought aboard and a handful of others were pulled out of the water. It was later discovered that the Leyland Liner, Californian, had been less than 20 miles away at the time of the, of the accident, but had failed to hear the Titanic's distress signal because its radio operator was off duty. The radio operator was off duty. In those days, uh, they had, were using radio for, for sending uh, messages, and part of that was distress calls, which came out from the Titanic. And yet, the response was negative. Nobody responded to the, the, the cry for help. And they were only 20 miles away, yet the radio operator was off duty. They were asleep. We, there's a song that's sometimes sung. Hold out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. As you think about that, the California was the vessel that had not responded. They, they could have heard the radio and gone to aid, uh, saved everybody, but they're, they were off duty. Is your ship sinking? Rescue is very close at hand. Rescue is very close. God is nigh. In our faith, we confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And recognizing that it's our sin that put him on the cross, we therefore repent of our sin. And having done these things, we can be baptized for the remission of sins. We, be, we can be immersed in the water that our sins would be forgiven. That we appeal to God out of a good conscience, our own good heart, appealing to God for forgiveness of sins, which is what baptism is, our appeal to God for forgiveness of sins and our obedient faith, trusting in his works to save us. Is your ship sinking? Rescue is very close. Do you heed the warnings? Do you heed the warnings? That is the invitation for this morning. So if you need to respond to the gospel invitation, we forgive the sins. Come forward as we stand, as we sing.